I want to tell you a little bit about myself and my journey in conservation. It's an unusual field um, and when I started off I was all of um, seven and um, I grew up in a privileged household. My father was the director of the All India Institute of Medical Sciences and everybody expected that I would become a medical doctor. I didn't for many reasons. I was born in All India Institute of Medical Sciences. I was brought up in the All India Institute of Medical Sciences and about 70% of people I knew were medical doctors. Three excellent reasons not to become a doctor. <laughs> so I, I sort of spent time running around the corridors of Ames and uh, my father was a very keen wildlife conservationist himself and on the Indian Board of Wildlife. And very early on I decided, you know, if I had to spend the rest of my life in a gloomy hospital um, with people who are irritable and in pain and not very happy, or well, the alternative was to be in some beautiful place looking at wonderful animals in sunshine. I think it was quite a clear choice for me and I made that decision. So this is me in the cities and this is me when I'm in the field. Two different sides of my personality, but then I'm a Gemini, so I'm supposed to have these two flip sides. Um, I was seven when I decided I wanted to become an ecologist. Everybody thought it was a strange new word I had learned and the next day I would go to fly a plane or, you know, become something else. I never changed my mind. And I grew up um, in the outdoors, um, absolutely fascinated by the natural world. I spent time focusing on big cats. My father took me to Chitwan where the Smithsonian Institute had started its first major study on the tigers. And they had this camera trap photograph that they had taken in the early 70s. And I grew up with that poster on my wall. Other people had film stars and musicians, I had tigers. And I never changed my mind and that's what I wanted to do. But as I grew older, I decided that I wanted to spend more time in Kashmir. A lot of my family is from Kashmir, my grandparents lived there. And I wanted to study snow leopards and also focus on the bear and the hangul and uh, that was really what I wanted to do, that was my dream. But in the late 80s, the trouble started in Kashmir and um, we were amongst the first families to be targeted. Our house was bombed and burnt with an incendiary bomb and seven people were shot dead on the farm. It became impossible for me to continue my work there and I was very lost, didn't know what to do and then I met Dr. H.S. Pavar, uh, who was a colleague and friend of my dad's and my dad and me had just started the Wildlife Institute of India. Dr. Pavar looked at me and said, do you have what it takes? Can you work in the field? And I said, yes, I can do that. He said, nobody has been able to make a breakthrough and work on tigers in this country. The tiger was our national animal. There had been no scientific work on the tiger, except for something in 1968 by an American scientist, George Schaller. And the tiger was part of a study by Dr. Olas Karan for his doctoral level work, but nothing else. It took me four years to get my permissions um, and, and begin my project. And I faced a lot of opposition, including the fact that I didn't look like a type of conservationist. I don't know what you're supposed to look like, but not like this apparently. It's, you know, I mean something else. I have people coming to me and say, we'd like to meet the researcher from the Wildlife Institute who's working on tigers. And I'd say, yes, no, you know, the man who's working on tigers? No, me, I'm the person working on tigers. People started describing me as the hat that drew the gypsy because I'm quite petite and you could only see my head and the hat and the gypsy and I used to be doing my research and driving around. So I got quite this reputation. Others would call me the girl in chiffon saris doing research on tigers. So it was an interesting time and um, I had to break into a very male dominated space. Um, I went into traditional academic research and I was doing that for quite a while. Um, 
and and realized that there was just so much more to it than what we had been traditionally told. Today, my quest is to study and photograph every large cat in the world. Um, towards this end, I photographed all of these species. Um, I have one left to go, which is the puma. And I'm going this year on another pilgrimage. These are my pilgrimages. Um, so I go to worship the puma in Patagonia in Chile. And apparently you can actually walk with them. You don't have to go um, on in a vehicle. So you go on foot and you can find the pumas and you can go and study them. So that's this July and it will be the final big cat on this series. And I'm also working on um, a two volume book on the great cats of the world right now. So coming back to my quest, um, how, did I, how did I set off and how did I do this work that I did? I was 22, um, straight out of college. I had uh, studied in the University of Delhi and then I got a scholarship and I went to the Institute of Terrestrial Ecology and the College of Forestry in uh, Wales, in England, in the UK. And I came back from that and I borrowed this friend's car. I had never driven a four-wheel drive. And I walked into his house and said, you know that, that Maruti Gypsy you have, may I have that? I grabbed the gypsy and I told my parents, I'm going to Madhya Pradesh. My mom freaked. She didn't know what to do. So she threw my ayah into the car with me. So my ayah and I drove across from Delhi to Madhya Pradesh in 1992. And um, there was no mobile phones. There was no connectivity. My car would constantly catch on fire and... I would, you know, the, the horn would set off and it not take off. So it was an adventurous time. I finally got to Bandhavgarh and that's where I did my doctoral work. And I covered um, 49,000 square kilometers in Madhya Pradesh, uh, focusing on Bandhavgarh in particular, but I also went to Achanakmar and uh, Kanha National Parks. That journey was the beginning of the greatest adventure of my life. And the next five years, I lived 11 months of the year with tigers in the wild. One on one, quite like the people that I used to admire. Jane Goodall, Diane Fossey, all the legends. And it was unbelievable. It was hard work. It was really, really hard work. Sometime during that time, National Geographic found out about what I was doing. And they made a film about me, which gave me the title, the Tiger Princess of India. I studied 37 tigers. Um, I proved to the scientific community that you did not need to do, use any invasive technologies to study tigers. You can identify every one of them and follow them if you spend enough time and make enough of an effort. Um, invasive technologies like Embedding chips are really useful if you're monitoring large populations and you're not spending time in one place years on end. But when you're doing a PhD study and you're with the animals 24-7, you can actually manage very easily without doing anything invasive. Even genetic sampling can be done without um, any invasive technologies. I spent time with them. They became a part of my family. I would be able to monitor and track all of these animals on a daily basis so much so that you could come and tell me I want to see so and so and I'd take you there, give or take a few hours up and down, we would find the animal um, and, and it would come out exactly where I would predict that it would come out. But it was not all good. Um, while I was doing my camera trapping, I found out that, that there were lots of poachers. I caught poachers on my camera traps. I um, saw people walking in with country-made weapons and I also saw what was happening with the forest department because their hands were tied and very limited by the rules. They followed the rules the others didn't. And um, I would see animal after animal being poached and it was just the most horrific thing that I could see. During this time also we had a huge outbreak of disease and we lost every last member of the girl family in the park. 
So I was seeing what local extinctions were doing and it was um, a big, big learning curve for me. Um, I also saw how people lived on the edge of the park. It was a, it's a very tough thing. So you would see one of these animals and then you would find them in a camera trap outside of the park. And they would be following all of the, the, the prey species that would be going out to raid the fields. So you'd have sambar and cheetal and wild boar, porcupine, everything going out of the field and destroying crops. Now in India, there's no crop compensation, there's no insurances. And in a night, a person can you lose an entire year's livelihood when 300 deer come in. And in retaliation, they would electrocute, poison, or kill these animals. And it just, it's, it's just the most horrific thing when you see this. Human-wildlife con conflict is a reality today. It's a very tough reality for me to face. Um, the first time I saw one of these animals being killed, it was, it was just all I could do to stop myself from, you know, going absolutely ballistic at the village that had done this. Um, I remember for my masters, I was studying elephants in Rajaji National Park and um, a mother and a baby were trying to cross because they had made this railway line between the two sides of Rajaji National Park and the mother got killed, the baby was about this big and um, he had to be hand raised and we called him Rail Bahadur for the lack of a better word. So Rail Bahadur grew up in ca captivity and had to be kept away from his herd and ultimately went into um, park stables, which is not really what you want for a wild elephant. Um, so the, the picture in the center where you see the buffalo with the man standing, that was behind my house in Kana. At 4.30 in the afternoon, the tiger came and attacked that buffalo. This man grabbed that little stick that you see him holding, that little bush. It was growing. It was a little sapling that was growing. He grabbed it yanked it out of the ground and biffed the tiger on the nose with it. And the tiger slid off the back of the buffalo. He had, you know, the buffalo had rake marks all the way down. And this man risked his life and defended the buffalo, which had been hands, hamstrung from the back um, because the tiger wanted to get it. So, I mean, it's really tough life. It's not, you know, the pretty pictures that you see in all the channels. Um, the other side effect of this is that when parents are killed, you have the babies. I was telling you about Ril Bahadur. Um, the sloth bear cubs um, are another casualty of this. They had to be brought up in captivity as well. And on the left is a clouded leopard um, who, that had been caught in Tripura in a, in, a, in a bear trap. And her paw was cut off and we had to amputate it and, and rehabilitate her. Um, so you keep coming cro across these incidents and it just became more and more apparent to me that maybe, just maybe, I did not have the luxury of only doing academic research. And I needed to get out there and do real work to make a change and make an impact in the field. So standing at the pyre of one of my tigers burning, my tigers because I spent so much time with them. They were a part of my life. It had been poached, they found the carcass and destroyed it. Standing at the pyre of my tiger burning, I took the decision that I would now change focus. Conservation creatively, but conservation that made an immediate difference every day in the field. We forget that we know, that we already know everything we need to know about conserving tigers. We don't need cutting edge science. We need to give them space and food and protection and they manage very well on their own. So I needed to make that happen. Conservation needs the participation of people. In India, people are everywhere. We don't have the luxury of space without people. And that's a reality we need to deal with. So the focus has to be on reforesting where we can and protecting what exists. This is a priority. 
uh, water conservation, building partnerships, fostering tolerance, ensuring di direct economic benefits to local communities, creatively disseminating information, combating poaching, and using tourism as a powerful tool for conservation. So what did I do? I started training the local people to act as guides so they had involvement. I did hands-on conservation by doing things like building water holes for the park, donating vehicles for poaching. I started building partnerships and fostering tolerance in the village communities by uh, looking at things like health, by looking at options like alternate energy and training them to use existing resources without depleting forest resources for energy. I worked a lot with the village schools on art, on education, on, um, on projects and take children every year into the park to show them what lies on the other side of the line. I organized festivals involving local communities. Two or three hundred people would come and we would showcase the local culture, the local diversity and the local indigenous knowledge on things like medicinal plants. I also involved the art community. We had in artist camps where we had people come together from 19 countries. And we created art and then auctioned it and used the money for projects on conservation. I do a lot of talks. I work with schools and colleges, children across the globe actually. Um, I've been involved with people like Dr. Anjali La Menon uh, to do uh, dra dance dramas to raise awareness. Um, I do books for children and I do a lot of talks and, blog and I also blog. I've been involved in the making of several films, Discovery, BBC, The Animal Planet, um, and of course, National Geographic. So I want to say that it's all about thinking creatively and about taking a step back, examining what you are doing, and not being afraid to step out of the box. That is really important, and that's the idea I'd like to leave you with today. Obstacles happen, you work around them, you hold on to your dream and think out of the box. Thank you.